uh, and and hopefully you can hear me on on Zoom. Uh, uh, welcome to our monthly lunch and learn. Uh, we're so uh, delighted that with technology we can share today's discussion with um, folks who are downtown here with me, folks who are in the sukkah with Rabbi Eric and others who are zooming in. Um, for just two uh, housekeeping announcements, for lawyers that are attending, if you'd like CLE, you have to do three things. You need to sign in on the attendance sheet. You need to fill out one blue form and one yellow form. Um, where it says title of the CLE, I think you can say out of Israel, lunch and learn. Um, and this month, lawyers will get a substantive CLE credit, not an ethics one. Um, if you'd like to be added to the uh, email list or have a friend that should be added, uh, get me their names and we'll do that. Um, and I think next month, Rabbi Eric, are you back here for that? I can't remember. I will tell you, hold on, I believe so. Yes, I am with you downtown on Wednesday, November 1st. That is the earliest possible first Wednesday in November. Excellent, <laughs> good observation. Um, but we're very um, pleased to be with you and um, ready to start a discussion. Rabbi Eric, thank you, and you have the floor. Well, it's good to be with you all. I thought that we would, since we have uh, some people who take the lunch part of Lunch and Learn very, very seriously, uh, let's say the bracha for being together in a sukkah. And you all can say amen, even if you're, this is like, you know, you used to be able to say amen to someone's blessing if you could hear it, it you know, uh, if you were present by hearing it. And now we're going to get an amen across the globe here, right? Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav B'tzivanu Le'shei Basuka. Okay. Go. Amen. All right. Why don't we get um, Richard? Can we get um, the full view so I can see everyone? There we go. Perfect. There we go. Um, all right. So uh, that's the 44 bus. To give you a sense of where we are, that's the 44 bus. Right over here is Kohelet, and they're doing construction. And uh, I believe that there's a trash route here today as well. So we should be just perfect. The point of a sukkah, and we're going to start with this as one of our um, uh, metaphors for our topic today. The point of a sukkah is that we are sort of subject to the... Um, we're not fully insulated, right? We're, we're subject to the whatever may come at us. And we are mindful of that. And I think that one of the lessons of sukkah that we sometimes overlook that I think will, will bear uh, important uh, as a metaphor for today is this idea that we go through our world with the base assumption that most of the time extraordinarily good or extraordinarily bad things are not going to happen most otherwise they wouldn't be extraordinary right that's the definition of extraordinary right the definition of extraordinary is that it's outside of the ordinary which means that the ordinary is not extremely incredible or extremely catastrophic right and uh we are going to be talking about today something of how we respond to something that is extremely catastrophic namely um if we are taken captive or hostage, or by some interpretations, even uh, unjustly imprisoned, some of these laws apply in all of those cases. And I think that um, that is going to be uh, uh, relevant for our, for our conversation uh, today. Because if you think about the sukkah, and you, you all can either experience it here or, or, or see it, or if you've been in a sukkah, and we have this, this is our second text. Does everyone, have, does everyone have access to one of these? Uh, okay, good. Um, and I'm going to, oh, I should share it too. Let me share the screen so that the people who are, yeah, the people, I hope you can hear me. The people who, yeah, there we go. That's it. 
the people who are online, you can also see the text. Um, we're looking at the second text, a sukkah whose shade exceeds its sunlight is kosher. When you look up at a sukkah, you're supposed to have more shade than the sun or at nighttime, the stars being let in. Okay, so check, we're pretty good here. Yeah. Now, if, as it has happened when, see, this time it rained during the building of the sukkah. <laughs> but by the time Sukkot actually happened, we were pretty golden. We Thank goodness, we've been pretty golden. It's supposed to rain again on Shemini Atzeret when we're out of the sukkah. So we'll take it, right? Um, but the, um, the general premise is that we are supposed to be, we are not, sorry, something specific. We are not supposed to be impervious right? To use a word that we often use when we're talking about uh, zoning and stuff like that. We are supposed to be, we're supposed to be uh, sort of able to and subject to the elements, but most of the, more than 50%, we're supposed to be protected. And I think that that's really important when you're talking about something like uh, captives or hostage taking and, and, and hostage redemption, because what we're really saying here is we're really saying um, most of the time, our shade or our shelter is more than our exposure, right? That's, that's kind of what we're saying. And yet, our laws tend to focus on those extraordinary moments when we're not like that, right? Because most of the time, we don't need, we don't need laws just to be normal. We just call it that normal, right? Or most of us don't need laws on how to be normal, right? But uh, I, I probably do need some reminders. <laughs> but um, but 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 the the sense of what it is when we are extraordinary is it, it becomes more um, difficult. So I will tell a story, and I may have shared this story with a couple of you. Um, but this is a story. I was teaching high school when 9/11 uh, happened in 2001. I was in rabbinical school, and I taught. Eric, this is Glenn. Um, can you hear us? Because we stopped hearing you. Here, you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, you should be able to see me, and we're yes. getting back on. We're having yes. some connectivity issues, but we'll we'll be okay. Right, um, so, uh, I, the story I was telling was that in. Um, so uh, I should be host at this point too, right? Hold on one second. Let me see if I should, if I, yes, I am host. Okay, I took over. Um, so the extraordinary circumstance at the time I was talking about was 9-11. Was I was teaching high school and I was teaching high school in Manhattan. And you can imagine that this was a very, you know, sort of everyone was kind of walking around Manhattan in a daze. You could still smell uh, the the fires at, 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 at the World Trade Center site. And it was, and, and everyone was in some way affected, uh, whether personally by personal tragedy and loss or uncertainty, or just by walking down the streets and seeing the pictures and the storefronts of, you know, have you seen my so-and-so? I mean, it was, a, it was a very, very, very difficult uh, and terrible time. And um, so uh, the, when you were teaching high school kids at that point in time, you had to walk into the class kind of and, and assess whether they were going to be able to hear the topic of conversation or whether we're going to sort of go off topic. And um, I walked in one day and they were all sort of not good. Let's just put it that way. And, um, and so hold on. Let me do, I'm just seeing you. Uh, we're coming back. Recording in progress. Okay. They were all not good. They were all not good. A, uh, you know, I, I sort of started and said, okay, let's, let's pull together and let's listen here on what's, what, what's on your heads. And they basically started to talk about how they felt because of this one extraordinary, horrifically extraordinary moment that they in general were not safe. 
And these are 15 year olds, basically, right, that, that are saying this in a, in a very sort of heartbreaking way, because we really work very hard to try to make our kids especially feel mostly safe. And I said to them, okay, how many of you took the subway to school today? It's a Manhattan school. Some kids came from outer boroughs. Some kids came from uh, uh, northern Jersey. Or, um, and so if you could just mute yourselves. Okay. Um, and uh, so they they came and, and they were, uh, they said, well, you know, I, I would say about two thirds of them taken the subway. By the way, one girl took the elevator to school. She lived in the floors above <laughs> the, the bottom two floors. The school was the bottom two floors of a building. She lived above. She was always the last person in school. She was always <laughs> late. Uh, she, she took the elevator to school. But, but most of them took the subway. And I said, okay, so you took the subway. How many of you waited on the platform for the subway? Well, everyone who took the subway waits on the platform for the subway. I said, how many of you uh, clung white knuckled to a pole uh, as the train was approaching because you were afraid that either by some happenstance of you slipping or someone pushing, God forbid, or something like that, that you would be in the path of the train. <clears throat> And they all looked at me and they said, well, none of us did that. That's, you can't live like that. You can't live like that. And I said, okay, so we are making a decision that we can't live like this, but we are going to take maximum legal and personal protections for those very few and sparing moments when we must live like that. That is what the laws regarding the redemption of captives uh, are about. These are for extraordinary cases that in certain circumstances were less extraordinary, meaning in evil times when brides were very much taken captive uh, for something that kings had, which was the right of prima noce, um, and uh, that, which means the first night. And, um, and so this was not a theoretical thing, but that's where we are. That's the, that's the basis on which we get the, 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 the text that we're going to learn today. Um, and so we're talking about something that feels extraordinary and ridiculous, but isn't. And frankly, uh, the way that it plays out is even in the extraordinary moment of a recent hostage negotiation with Iran, in which um, the United States agreed to unfreeze six billion dollars in oil assets, uh, giving that money back to Iran. They said <clears throat> that um, you couldn't use that money for anything but humanitarian purposes. But anyone who has ever done a budget before knows that money is fungible, meaning if I want to have $6 billion, I can say, well, your $6 billion I'm going to spend on hospitals, but ha ha ha, that frees up another $6 billion to send in convoys to Hezbollah, right? Okay, um, you know, in, in the form of rockets. So of course, this is um, putting lipstick on a, uh, on, a, on a pig, but that's what the United <laughs> States needed to do uh, in this moment. You know, I love that saying, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, but that's what the United States felt that they needed to do in, in this moment. Um, there's a long thing about we don't negotiate with terrorists, and that became a difficulty because the United States had a, my understanding is, split hairs a little bit to say, well, this part of Iran is not terrorist, is a, is a governmental entity, but this part, namely, namely the Revolutionary Guard, is a terrorist entity, so we're not going to negotiate. You can see how all of these things get very complicated very quickly. Uh, and so, um, but the United States did this. And in the end, someone who was endangered, a human life that has inestimable value, was saved. And then, of course, the pundits start asking, yes, but at what cost? Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about. That's why this is ripped from the, the headlines right now. Judaism has a 2,000 year old history of struggling with these matters. Um, and we're going to look at the Ketuba contract. We're going to look at uh, what the IDF has done about this, which is disproportionate uh, exchanges of prisoners, even for bodies of prisoners. 
um, uh, no longer living, and, uh, and and we're going to talk about it. So that's what we got. That's a very long introduction um, uh, for uh, about how safe we are in a sukkah and how how extraordinary these topics are. So let's look at the first text on the page, which is a text that actually comes. It's a, it's a silent part of the service. So we unless you sing it, which has a beautiful melody to it. Um, Unless you sing it, 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 it often not, you know, easy, easily overlooked, but this is, uh, comes right after uh, the weekday Torah service. And the melody is, if you've ever heard it, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful melody about the idea that we have people who are being persecuted and held hostage, we as Jews, around the world. Um, and uh, so would someone like to read uh the weekday morning service our, our first text this is the one we say it every day so how extraordinary could it be if we're saying this every single day right would someone like to read i can't see you all on uh on zoom so uh if you want to read you can just start or someone local can start as well so i want to read our brothers and sisters i'll take it i always do our brothers and sisters the entire house of israel who still read What's that? And Marsha's reading now. We'll, we'll, we'll get everyone a chance to read. Don't worry. Go ahead. Who still remain in distress and captivity, whether on sea or on land. May God have compassion on them and bring them from distress to relief, from darkness to light, from servitude to redemption at this moment, speedily, very soon. And let us say, Amen. And that's the source also of our uh, of our topic, hashta, uh, of our uh, title today, Hashta Ba'agalahu Vizman Kariv, which the melody goes, Hashta Ba'agalahu Vizman Kariv, which means it's got to happen soon, right? We, this is an immediate need. Someone is, it's not like, oh, you know, let them, let them hang in prison for a little bit. We'll see what we can negotiate. There is a sense that when someone is held hostage, that their life is in immediate and acute danger, not uh, let's see what we can do here. And the, it's, it's, it's actually the idea of mitzara, the way to take you from a confined space. It's like mitzrayim, a confined space, okay? Or minha mitzar, same word, right? Okay, to the expansive open uh, relief, right? From darkness to light, from enslavement to redemption. Now, it says, we got to do it now, right? So that's the basic idea. This is what we're going to talk about. Um, and um, and uh, this is given, the idea of, of ransoming is given incredible, uh, incredible priority, right? So much so that it's considered one of the greatest mitzvot. Rava teaches to Rabba Barmari that this is a great mitzvah. Um, okay, and uh, the, we, the, the text here, I'll just tell you how the text works. Uh, basically, uh, Rava, uh, Rabba Barmari, sorry, Rabba Barmari um, speaks in the center text on the first page and says, well, there are a lot of bad things that can happen to us, but in this list from Jeremiah, they go from kind of bad to really, really bad, right? Okay, and uh, if you look at them, it's a little counterintuitive. The first one, which is bad, but not the most bad, is death. Then the sword, then famine. And what is the most bad of all the bad things that can happen? Captivity. Captivity, Captivity becomes the most bad thing that can happen. And uh, if you think about that, I, I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, and I'm, I'm being so sort of analytical about it. But, you know, going back to give me liberty or give me death, but like in some ways, um, in some cases, the assumption here is that this is that, that being in captivity, being held, is a fate worse than death. Okay? And therefore, it is incumbent upon the Jewish community to redeem that person. And that's why we say it every day. We have to say, we are asked in our shoals to say every day there are Jews who are in need of redemption. And not just Jews, of course, but but you know, the, the liturgy focuses a little bit more on, on Jews. By the way. At times in our even modern Jewish history, this liturgy and these teachings felt a little more um, relevant and more uh, immediate, that's the word I was thinking of, than, uh, than uh, perhaps now. But I, I think of, um, 
I think of the movement for to save Soviet Jewry, yeah. right? If it, you know, I'm I'm a little young uh, to remember to remember it in a, in a, in, a, in a sort of purposeful way, but I do remember, uh, you know, in in the 1980s. Um, the, uh, the the marches and 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 the efforts, and then in the late '80s and early '90s, the massive efforts both in Israel and here for resettlement of Jews once the Iron Curtain uh, fell. And and I would imagine that this line from the weekday morning service of "Let's get them out." <clears throat> yeah, these are these are Jews big big things. Jews of Syria, Syria. right? If you yeah. so, I, I I think of uh, the 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 Safam song, right? Which in the eighties was uh, it was called it was called Amnesty, right? And it was you may remember the song. I'm going to sing you a little bit of the song, and you'll you'll be like, wow, I haven't heard that song since like 1984. But uh, it was good. Let them out, yeah, let them out, let them out tonight. Let me make it clear to you, get them out of Syria. Terrible slant rhyme, but it's true. Um, but uh, but but that was a big thing, and. Um, and it literally said the lines of that song, and this was like, it's like a Jewish rock group saying, whether it's a Hitler, Brezhnev, or Assad, oh. right? When will they all learn that we're all children of one God, right? I mean, that becomes like incredibly, incredibly uh, evocative to people, right? And the equation, which was in a pop song, right, of Hitler, Brezhnev, and Assad, right, is, uh, is, 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 that's what we're talking about. And, and so, so this, it's not so ancient is my point. The next question though then becomes a little bit more difficult, which is, okay, we are committed to redeeming it with ransom, Worst line in the back, right? There, Josh Peck is saying it's a terrible, it's a terrible slant rhyme. I told you it's a bad slant rhyme, yeah. but there it is. It's also the line that everyone screamed, right? Uh, you know, uh, because that was—I don't know why—but that 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 was a big, big anthem in some ways, right? So the question is, okay, now we are ready to um, redeem people. And it's given the status of the greatest mitzvah and all and it, and being in captivity is worse than death. And then the question is, all right, so how much? Right. And immediately, and I think interestingly, the um, the the Talmud starts to starts to try to put limits on what a ransom could be. This feels weird to put limits on what a ransom should be because we're saying it's worse than death. And we have this line that's at the bottom of every uh, single federation fundraising brochure that, that exists, that the person, one who saves a single human life is like they've saved the world. It sounds like the value of a single human life is, is, is infinite. You can't even compare, it's, it's like out, out, uh, complete, completely maximized, um, and the Talmud really works hard, as does the Torah before it, to put finite values, to put caps on that feel-good statement. And I will say this, early in COVID, this was a conversation. It is a highly, highly uncomfortable conversation. But when the question came of how long can we completely close? And this was still when Italy was sending people home without ventilators and saying, you're not likely to live on a ventilator, or at least not as likely as this person. So you are gonna go home and essentially die because we don't have the resources for you. So this was early, early in COVID. We are talking like, spring 2020 into early summer 2020. That's what we're talking about here. There were real conversations from ethical standpoints of, we know we were, we were able to theoretically measure how many billions into trillions of dollars it was costing to shut down the world in terms of commerce. And we knew because we were pretty crazy about keeping these statistics too, about how many people were dying of COVID. 
it's just simple division at that point in time to know the value of a human life. It's just simple division. You just divide the total numbers of trillions of dollars by the total number of people who need medical assistance. That's tough, right? But that's, that's what the value, I mean, I taught a class of how much is a human life worth? Because that's what people were doing. And, um, and it became a, a real ethical quandary. The Torah talks about this early on, right? I gave you one example of it. Two men fight, one of them, they get in a fight, of course, people are around. One of them gets pushed into a pregnant woman or pushes a pregnant woman while they're fighting. Uh, she loses, God forbid, the baby. Um, then we know exactly what that's worth. He shall be immersed the value of the offspring to the husband. We estimate her value according to what she was worth if she was sold as a slave in the market, giving her a higher value on account of her being with child. We say these things like, oh, yeah, you know, what's your going rate, right? That's what Rashi says here. But, but, the point is not the amount or even how it's calculated. The point is that it is calculable, right? That there is a finite value regardless of the next Mishnah, which I quoted already, okay? I'm gonna go through a couple more of these texts and then I'm gonna pause because a, a lot of these texts actually all speak to the same thing. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. Um, and then we'll spend a little more time on Rabbi Meir Meor Agola. Um, but the next three texts, I think, all sort of bring us to the same point, and then I'll take some questions, and then we'll move to, move to Rabbi Mayer. Okay. Um, okay, and so we have this idea of a theor theoretical monetary value that comes from the Torah of what you would gain if you were either, well, in this case, probably an indentured servant on the market, right? That would be your value. Um, and it says in Mishnah Gittin, at the top of the second page, that not only should you not pay more than that value, or, or not only are you not obligated to pay more than that value, but what's next? What does it say? You must not pay more than that value. Huh. Whatever that value is calculated. I know that some of you are saying, I don't like putting values on humans, right? It feels very uh, inhumane. But the Torah does it, and, and, and in a real world, where if you manage to kidnap, if you were a bandit and you managed to kidnap one person, if there were no limits on that in the real world, there would be, there would be, it would be a very lucrative practice, right? I mean, when the United States did it recently, how do you get up, how do you get the number billion. of six billion? Six billion is a big number, but at some point in time, they were haggling. How many people were, did they bring? They brought one. 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 Right. Uh, at some point in time, it was a negotiation. Right. And the second it becomes a negotiation, meaning the second you're willing to say, I'm not going to give you everything. Then from the purposes of the ethics of it, it almost doesn't matter what the number is at the end. Right. You've already said, yes, there's a Order. There's an outer boundary of this, right? And the IDF does this all the time. And the IDF does it with highly disproportionate, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll re release hundreds of people who are found guilty of terrorist acts that caused the deaths of Israeli citizens, Jews and Arabs. And they will release them to get not even just one prisoner back, like a Gilad Shalit or someone like that, they'll release them to get the body of someone who fell in battle back to, to you know, the, someone who's, who's deceased, right? Sometimes they will release it just to get proof that the person is deceased, to give the family closure. And the reason that they do that is because they want the families, you know, it's a civilian army, it's a, you know, everyone serves in some capacity, not mm -hmm. all in frontline stuff. And, and the reason they do that is they, the, the IDF wants to be able to say to these parents who are sending their kids and these kids who idolize the paratroopers and the Golani who are on the front line, they want to be able to say, we leave no one behind. I remember when I was in high school, I had the dog tags of Ron Arad, right? Fighter pilot, 
Syria went down in Syria, right? This was huge and it continues to be huge. So why is it that there is a limit on this? Because once you start negotiating and a limit exists, um, it says for the betterment of the world, because otherwise uh, kidnapping would be so lucrative that even people who are not, you know, in their kishkas kidnappers, they'd be like, well, you know, I made a couple of bad business decisions, but I could fix that with one good kidnapping. Right? And you don't want people to be tempted in that way, right? And so it's for the betterment of the world. We're going to put a cap on it. You're not supposed to do it. Rabban Shimon Gamliel actually turns it a different way. He says, um, uh, that the captives, because um, uh, if the captives were to escape, uh, okay, uh, so it says, uh, one may not, not aid the captives in their attempt to escape, also for the betterment of the world, so the kidnappers will not be more restrictive in their, you want to keep it so that they treat the, the captives well, so there's a chance for making big on the money, and also, if there's a chance that they escape, um, uh, that they don't, uh, they're not mean to the ones who don't escape, essentially like that. Um, now, this clause is written in the ketubah. I promised when I married Deva that if she were ever taken by pirates, <laughs> that I would redeem her. That was, and it, by the way, it's not actually explicitly in my ketubah. There's no pirate clause in my ketubah because it's what it is known as in the bold in the second text that you have there, it's known as Tana'i Beit Din. Tana'i Beit Din means it is a automatic clause of the ketubah, regardless of whether it is explicitly stated. Meaning if you get married, this is part and parcel of what it means to get married. So you don't have to actually even say it. All what my ketubah says is um, we are being married according to the laws of Moses and Israel and according to the stipulations of Chachamenu Zichronam Livracha, which means our sages. And everything, there's a whole list of things that are in there as Chachamenu Zichronam These are all the things that you don't read. But they're all in there that you're fine signing print. on. To the, fine it's print. not even the fine print. It doesn't have to be printed. <sighs> Right? It's like, I, I, this, is, this is part and parcel of what it means to get married. But of course, then the sages also say that there's a limit, right? So if David gets taken from captivity, obviously I would do everything in my power. But I'm only obligated, which means anything over and above this I did, I'd really get good points, right? <laughs> but I, I'm only obligated <laughs> to do 10 times her value, the usual ransom. And that's only the first time. If she gets cap, if she gets captured a second time, I'm, I'm off the hook completely. <laughs> no, the children have nothing to do with it. It's the value. It's it's in the ketuba, and children have nothing to do with it. Right? Okay. If they want her that much, they can have her. <laughs> <laughs> a second time, my gosh, this is really, it's like you get kicked off the insurance policy, right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And, <clears throat> what's that? She does not have to rescue me. The, ketu the ketubah is an obligation on my part. She would want to, obviously. Oh, or she might want to write them just a, a thank you note, right? A thank you note, right? Okay. <laughs> Right, women didn't have the ability to ransom. They didn't have the ability to ransom. She has the value of her ketubah, right? And that plays in here too. Um, and uh, so Rabbi Shimon von Gamliel says that one does not redeem captives at more than their value. And we talked about that earlier. Um, and what do they say? Well, that's the value of the ketubah. That's the value of the, of the, of the marriage contract. Shimon von Gamliel is a little bit more of a, a hard line on this thing. He really feels like if you don't put a cap on this, it's going to increase the problems in the world. And he's willing, this is really important, he's willing to forego one person in captivity for the sake of the broader, greater good, so as to not encourage more people to kidnap. Oh. He said, that is, he says, that is a tragedy, but think of what redeeming that person, the tragedies that are likely to come. And so it becomes 
in some ways a deterrent, right? Because you say you don't want to lose that deterrent in, in some way if, if there's no, uh, Susan, Susan is saying, I'm looking at my ketubah, which is the standard form of the Israeli military uh, rabbinut. Where would it be? It would say something like, uh, or or something along those lines. You would be you you are you uh, you, you would have been uh, protected in 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 that way. So um, so now I'm going to pause for a second before we get to a a what, what was a real life attested example of this from the um, I believe 11th century. Uh, but uh, and and see if there are any questions because you can see this raises an incredible amount of issues the value of a human life if, if in effect this is worse than death it raises the questions of what is the whole idea of putting a cap on that and it, it does raise questions of deterrence meaning like um you know if if or or encouraging bad acts i guess if, if there were if it were limitless uh, limitless so I'll ask any questions, any thoughts, any comments, people online, people in person, people in person in Philadelphia, go. Go ahead, Marcia and I, then Jonathan. Well, I, I have a question about captivity versus imprisonment. If, 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 if you're imprisoned, you're a captive, but what's that? There's a distinction because yes. you're imprisoned for a bad reason, but so, you know. Right, so I, I'll say this, I was gonna get to this with Reverend Mayor, but, but I'll, oh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll get to it. Mm -hmm. The question was, what is the distinction in these laws between captivity and imprisonment? And in some ways, given the rhetoric around the ruling and often persecuting authorities, very often there was no distinction. Meaning if the Romans took you, or the Greeks took you, that was bad and it was outside of the Jewish jurisprudence process. And therefore you were definitionally a captive, captive. even though you may have been uh, convicted of a crime under someone else's judicial process. Yeah. This becomes very, very relevant in modern times when we talk about uh, imprisonment uh, and racial or other uh, uh, inequities in imprisonment. Because the language and the rhetoric that is used is the leaders in the Black community. And I've had conversations about this with my friend, Reverend Good, who was here in the sukkah with us uh, a couple of days ago is language of when you are imprisoned in a way that is not ec racially equitable, meaning that then in some ways, if you're, if you're, if the authority, if the authority of the imprisoners is not just, then in some ways you are seen as a captive. It gets complicated because in modern times, especially because in many of these, Cases. The issue is not whether a crime has been committed, it is whether crime in general is equitably enforced. And sentences are equitably made out. Much more complicated question than the one we're talking about here, right? But the fact and the reason why I included, and I was especially purposeful to include imprisonment as part of this is that the rhetoric and language used in the Black community today is eerily similar to the rhetoric and language used by Jews who, were in, who are redeeming people imprisoned by ruling mostly often Christian authorities. And that is something that should give us pause. And I don't know whether it is purposeful or whether, meaning like, they adopted the rhetoric because, or whether it's just the feeling, the kishkes, as it were, right? I don't know the answer to that, but I know that that language becomes, you, you, I, I, my rabbinic ear hears the echoes of it, and I go, wow, they're not viewing, the whole system, they're not viewing as just. They're viewing it as a kidnapping. 
And the fact that that person may, let's say, have been detained with a small amount of an illicit substance becomes less relevant than what is likely to happen to that person relative to what is likely to happen to a white person. And, and, that, and that becomes, I, again, I, I'm not an expert in these things. I'm just telling you that the rhetoric, the parallels in the rhetoric are eerie. Right? That, that's what I'm, that, that, that's all I'm saying in that. And it is uh, tricky. Okay, Beth said there are five people that were freed, freed for the six billion. And, uh, once you're, again, it's that terrible joke of the guy picking up the woman in the, in the, in the bar. At this point, we're just negotiating. If you don't know the joke, I'm not putting it on the internet. So, uh, but if you need to know the joke, that's why you're not near the microphone. Someone whispered to someone, okay, about the joke. Now we're just haggling. Okay, so, um, uh, any Jonathan, go ahead. I just think your topic is so incredibly timely because it was a national kidnapping. It was a national captivity, an eerie redemption, and the girl was safe in her own internal sukkah. It wasn't a real sukkah, but she was held in a, in a camper. Oh, the camper. I thought of it during sukkah time because I knew what you're talking about. The nine-year-old. Right, the nine-year-old who was, yeah. who was yeah, right. Exactly. So, and, and these are things, um, you know, when you, when you think about it, these are, these are negotiations, right? And, and it's awful, right? Because, because at some point in time, if you're a hostage negotiator, and actually one of the international American citizen who was one of the great negotiators over the last, let's say two decades just died, Bill Richardson, right? Governor of uh, uh, New, New Mexico, Mexico, New Mexico, Mexico right? right. Um, he was called in and done. But at some point in time, if you ask someone like Bill Richardson, you have to put a side, you have to both hold that that's a, that's a human being that you're working for at that moment, and you have to put it aside. You have to almost be like a little, uh of two minds right because if you say that's a human being and you only say that then your limits are almost <clears throat> the sky is the limit right the sky is the limit and by the way it is possible and this is what Reverend Shiva Mangamliel and others were concerned about that it emboldens future people yeah. and by the way in this particular case of the Iran one like I said does anyone believe that Iran is not sending one cent of that $6 billion <laughs> on a convoy? I, I mean, does anyone in the world, every time we free up money, we know that some percentage of it is going to sponsor world terror. That's because that's what Irani, I, I, the Iranian government does. Not the Iranian people, by the way, the Iranian government. You could even make the case, by the way, that the Iranian people in some ways are being held captive by their government. Mm -hmm. yes. sure. Right? <laughs> um, and, and, and these become incredibly uh, difficult situations. By the way, Rav Cook this is a totally different text, made the case that we all are held, he basically was speaking of the immorality of the time and social mores and things like that. We are all being held captive by the social, like, you know, but you, you get the idea. Uh, any questions on Zoom? You can unmute yourself or ask a question before we move on to Rav, Rabbi Mayer. Rabbi, just an observation. Yes, go ahead. Having sat on a jury in a wrongful death case and had to put a value on the life of the deceased, this is very real in so many different contexts. Okay, so and trying to calculate what that person's mm -hmm. life was worth. Right. So, so Michelle, Michelle was talking about uh, having sat on a jury on a wrongful death case where you have to actually calculate what that what that person's life is worth. Right. And and the, this goes back to the time of the Torah. There are actual like, you know, this one's worth this much. This one's worth less. Right. And and uh, and it has to do with productivity and it has to do with military service and it has to do with the uh, responsibilities to others and who relies on this person and, and all of those all those things. And once you again it's the same thing once you start calculating it you're already in a different place like it's absurd but it's right. like you know watching children and child care and how many hours and yeah. awesome. any other comments i i unshared just so we could see the 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 the, the group um ready to move on to our i called it a historically attested example 
instead of a real life example, because I have this thing, I don't know if you have this, where um, feel things that are a thousand years ago don't feel like real life. We have to remember that they were real life. So I have to paint a picture of who Rabbi Mayer was. Share it. Is that? I'm going to share your thing. Oh, yeah, I will in a second. Oh, yeah. So we're talking about a guy named Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg in Germany. Incredibly influential rabbi in his lifetime, uh, so much so that his influence expanded well beyond what was mostly localized rabbinic authority in that time, because you know you couldn't email you know my rabbi who lives in uh, Jerusalem who knows a lot about certain laws, and I say, hey, Rabbi Roth, what do you think of this one, right? So most rabbinic authority, with, with, with exceptions of things that could wait a little longer, um, was very local. Rabbi Meir was known as Meor Hagola, which meant the enlightenment of the entire diaspora. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. He had a very expansive um, influence, and he had such an expansive influence that, among other things, he wrote what were known as uh, rabbinic decisions that were unapologetically what were known as takanot. Takanot are when a rabbi gets up, and this rabbi obviously has to have widespread recognized uh, authority, says, I know what the halacha is, and I'm changing it, <clears throat> or I'm adding to it, or I'm taking away from it. I know what it is. You're right that if I were just basing this on precedent, my decision would be different. But there's a bro more important uh, process at work here. And so what was, was I'm changing it. Uh, that's how influential this guy was. Uh, a couple of his takanot that you uh, still know about today. Uh, one is he had a takana about not reading other people's mail. And the reason for that was that there was all sorts of fraud and things like that. And if you open someone else's mail, it doesn't say thou shalt or thou shalt not in, uh, about this in anywhere in the Talmud, right? And he basically said, this is bad. It's going to cause problems. It's going to cause business problems. It's going to be reliability problems. And Jews are too dispersed such that mail courier, essentially, is the only way that we can reliably communicate with one another. And so if I put my seal on a letter, a missive that's going to Rabbi so-and-so, I don't know, let's call him Rashi in mm -hmm. France, I don't want someone opening up the mail, putting a knot in you know in in there and reversing my opinion so if you open up my letter to rashi by the way they lived within 100 years of whatever okay if you open up my letter to rashi that is a, a crime the other one that fascinatingly uh has stuck around it's a, it's both fascinating that it took a couple thousand years to for someone to to, to say it and that it's lasted a thousand years is that this is the guy who forbade polygamy. Because ah. in the Torah, you know, marry multiple wives, right? Okay. And he said, that's bad for everyone. Let's not do it. It's bad for the women because you're dividing the wealth and protective, uh, protection of a ketubah. It's bad for the men because I'm not going to say it because it'll make me sound like a jerk. And, 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 and it's bad for everyone. Let's not do that. Lasted a thousand years and was recently re-upped. It has also, that one, been um, waived a couple of times. You can get a hundred rabbis from three different continents to waive Takanat Rabbeinu Meir. And these are cases when, for example, uh, there's a man, uh, it actually works more, more significantly with a woman, uh, a, wom a woman whose husband is, or a man whose wife would 
be in this particular case, is so ill as in a vegetative state or something like that, and they allow this person without a get to remarry. But not remarry, take a second wife. Because he wants to stay obligated to this wife, and he is, they want to keep him still obligated to the care of this wife, and they want him to live the life. This is just Jewish law, though. It's, it's not, all Jewish law. It's all Jewish law. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yes. So uh, so you can get a hundred rabbis uh, spreading over a minimum of three continents to say for this specific case, Rabbeinu Meir's takana does not apply, and then the man can marry a second wife. But you need a hundred. You know, a hundred rabbis to sign. And and this has happened, by the way, uh, in rabbinical conferences, like international, like I don't know. Chabad did it or something like that, where they'll get these international rabbis <clears throat> to uh, all when they're all coming together in some place and they're saying, we need Maya Rabbanim, we need 100 rabbis. And they can't all be from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to share again. Here we go. This is a story of Rabbeinu uh, Mayer, who was taken captive, he himself. He and his family were going abroad. Uh, they got out of Germany as far as Lum uh, Lombardy, which is um, like between Germany and France, right? Okay, right, okay. You'll help me with the geography here, right? Um, and uh, he, he attracted quite a uh, following, right? And um, they were passing through, uh, and um, there was a person who was Jew who had been Jewish, who had been baptized, converted to Christianity. Someone like that is always suspect by the Christian world. But you, you know, you were originally Jewish, right? And so they're always looking for a way to get into the good graces of the Christian authority. So he goes up to the uh, Bishop of Basel. His name was Knepe, right? Which loosely translates in Yiddish to schmuck. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's my understanding, which, by the way, is ironic because it's also Yiddish. But like, um, but but uh, but like, this is I, we don't even know if that's his real name, right? Okay, right. He reckon this this former Jew says, "Oh, that's Rabbi Mayer. Wouldn't it be awesome if I told the bishop about that? They kidnapped Rabbi Mayer. They imprisoned Rabbi Mayer on whatever trumped up charges. It doesn't matter. And then, uh, and I'm going to get into the good graces of the bishop." Right. That's what it is. He's sitting in prison. And one of the things uh, was that he was leading a, a bunch of people, some said toward Israel, or maybe North Africa, who knows. But anyway, like, Jews moved all over the place all the time. They were just, you know, it was like, uh, it was like playing Frogger, right? You just had to avoid the latest persecuting religious authority, right? Okay, and so Jews were moving all over the place. And, but the problem was that there were sort of poll taxes based on Jews and things like that. And so if you lost your Jewish population, you also lost money, right? And so if Rabbi Mayer, look, one family moves, you don't notice it. But a, a family like Rabbi Mayer that tends to attract a whole entourage of people, well, that's going to hurt my pocket. And so they imprison him, right? Uh, and uh, the emperor at the time demanded a huge redemption ransom, right? And the Jewish community simply couldn't pay it. Uh, they, uh, they asked for 30,000 marks, according to one report, which of course, for I mean, no one had that, right? Okay. Um, and uh, Rabbi Mayer sent word from wow. his prison cell that he was exempting the Jewish community where, which and wherever he may find himself from the mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuyim, of redeeming the captive, at any rate whatsoever, because he knew that they were doing it to extort money. Either the poll tax or both, right? And he died. Seven years later. He died in prison. Yeah. He's a dude. 50s, an Arab nation uh, captured David Ben Gurion. Think about what Israel would have. Well, they would have sent someone in, and it would have been like some midnight raid, and it would have been like <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> right? But like, but like, imagine what they would have paid symbolically. 
to get their leader back. <clears throat> the sky is the, almost the limit, right? And then imagine if this young fledgling state that didn't have any money and was fighting wars on three fronts as it was, got word out of prison that Ben-Gurion in code, let's say they took a video and he holds up the arets of that day and he puts it down right in the whole thing. Ben-Gurion manages to get in code saying, don't. That's what this was like, right? Because the greater good, the fear that there is a price when you value the individual, and granted, this is a big individual, but of any individual, that the, when you value the individual so much over the broader safety of the community, that what happens then? That the, broad, the broader community is um, endangered, is endangered, right? I, I hate to say it because I don't like to speak in generalities about any nationality or stuff like that, but the terrorists in Gaza know that if they take a prisoner, they're going to get hundreds of prisoners. That's why they, among other reasons, that's why they do it, among the reason of terror. It's effective. This is complicated. It was complicated for the United States. And frankly, the Biden administration came under incredible pressure mm -hmm. both to do it and, and not, not to, to do, do it. it. So that's all I got for you today. Um, right, Susan said, uh, the dictum about notification. This is Lynn. There's an item in the chat you might want to comment on. Right. There's no negotiations with terrorists coupled with the Israeli arrogance gave us malot, the idea, right, that we can do this. That, look. We like to tell the story of Entebbe, right? But let's be honest. The fact that Entebbe was extraordinary was a fact because very often those sorts of missions don't work. They don't work. And everyone cheered in Entebbe. And by the way, cheered in Entebbe, but there was that one elderly person who was taken to the hospital who was then killed by Idi Amin. Right? Tell that to her family. Mm -hmm. Right? These things are tricky. These are tricky. So that's what I have. You. I don't have an answer for this one. I really don't have an answer for this one. But I know that the cost of those five uh, prisoners who were released for $6 billion in unfrozen oil assets is more than $6 billion. It's the terror that is derivative from those $6 billion, which will happen. And Israel now, it's gonna to fall to Israel, obviously, to bomb more weapons convoys over the skies of Syria that are coming from Iran to Hezbollah in Southern Lebanon. That's gonna be on Israel. It's also going to, um, Entebbe only worked because the Israelis had been in Entebbe, right? They knew the airport. They sat and they, they laid out the airport. They knew it, right? Um, uh, and it will also come because of emboldened attempts at hostage taking. We know that to be the case or imprisonment, right? The judicial systems exist to imprison Americans anywhere on any pretense, right? Brittany, uh, Beth, uh, Brittany Griner, right? Okay. okay, all of these things, right? And so, so these things become they come at a cost that is hard to assess. Rabbi Mayer knew that. And he literally sacrificed himself. And I can assure you, by the way, his treatment in prison was not Club Med. Especially as the, if were, once word got out that he had told the Jews not to redeem. You think they're like, oh, Rabbi Mayer, looks like you're gonna be here for a while. Let me give you an extra pillow. That's not the way this worked. <laughs> Right, and uh, and and so you can imagine, uh, you know how how horrific these situations are, and how unimaginable they are, and by the way, unimaginable for the uh, for, for the families of those who are sure, the captive, who are who are waiting and not giving up hope. Rona Rod's very nice wife, widow, but Rona Rod's widow, decades decades was a public figure on this. Ellie Cohen, who 
was the man in Damascus is mm -hmm. uh, who was a spy, spy. Israeli mm -hmm. spy mm -hmm. in Damascus who came to be like you know rubbing elbows with uh, with the Syrians and and ended up probably helping immeasurably in the uh, Yom Kippur and Six Day Wars, right? Because he's the one, the story goes that he said, he said, um, he, he took a tour of the Golan Heights when it was in Syrian hands, mm -hmm. right? And he said, oh my God, your guys, they're in such, uh, such heat all the time. When you send them out to the Golan Heights, you should really plant a eucalyptus tree to give them shade. They grow fast, lots of shade, whatever. And then he sent word to the Israelis, bomb the eucalyptus tree. Right. <laughs> Right? Okay, but he eventually was caught. who was a baby at the time, had a bar mitzvah, you know, children of all soldiers, bar mitzvah, like mass bar mitzvah. And he spoke for this bar mitzvah class. It was multiple bar mitzvahs at once. And he said, you know, you're a hero. Everyone knows me by who my father was. I wish you weren't so much of a hero. Mm -hmm. he, said, I w he said two things. He said, I wish you weren't so much of a hero because then you would be with me at my bar mitzvah. Yeah. And he said, I promise that when my time comes, which is only five years later for Israeli boys, I'll strive to live in your, go follow your footsteps. Think about that. Did you stop somebody, uh, a uh, Anyway, have a good day, everyone. Good. Have a good uh, rest of, of, of Sukkot, whatever holiday this is, right? Saturday night and Sunday. Bye. And Take care, November everybody. November 1st, which is square in the middle of Cheshvan. Thank you. Can you end it for all? Thank you, Lynn.